We want to hopefully inform farmers about the Agri-Environment Scheme and specifically what Manx Wildlife Trust's role in delivering it is. is, is. We want to give you a chance to ask questions and, and there'll be a big element of this at the end, hopefully while you've got food out of the room, where, where you can ask questions. Either is an open forum and, and I'll do the, the, the microphone part or if you're more comfortable just coming up and chatting to us afterwards, please just come up and chat to us afterwards. Um, another huge aim of tonight for us is that you get to meet David and, and, and David's presentation will follow me shortly and, and we want people to contact David. David's already got in contact, or farmers are, are now in liaison with over 100 farms in the island which is significant but, but we want all the farmers, all the active farmers to get in touch with David so that we can make those connections. Um, so across the world we're aware that you know, there is some disagreement occasionally between farmers and conservationists some of you know this, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but some of my background, a significant amount of my own background, was, was in crop growing, predominantly horticulture, that's what I studied, and I've worked with farmers in agricultural colleges, I've, I've been a lecturer and also worked with farm development in a, in a small island in the middle of nowhere. So I have some background in farming, but, but now I'm very proud to be part of a wildlife trust. So for me, I don't see them as conflicting things, I, I genuinely see them as things that, that need to work together and, and that's where we need to be going. So why do Manx Wildlife Trust and, and why am I so personally infused that, about the Agri-Environment Scheme? David's got a lovely graphic on this, but just to, to, to drip this in, and it doesn't matter if you hear it twice, Manx Wildlife Trust, fantastic organisation, we're nearly 50 years old, hopefully, you know, a great reputation in the Isle of Man. But our nature reserves, which are our prime land, cover 0.2% of the island. So when we feel that we're doing great stuff for the island, in our control is 0.2% of the island. But yet agriculture and farming associated industries covers 88% of the island. So in blunt terms, if we can get tiny gains over some of that 88%, that is a massive win for nature and what we're trying to do as a wildlife trust. So let's get it out there. That, that, that's why we're doing this. You know, that, that is our top line. So we are enthused about this um, and we also want to be pragmatic. Uh, and again, David's going to talk more about this, but, but you don't have to view us as people coming in trying to pick faults. We, 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 you know, nothing's perfect and we want to work with farmers. And if you're enthused about trying to do more for nature, then we want to try and help you do that in a way that doesn't damage your business per se, it helps you. Now that might sound utopian, but David again will give you more details. It, it, it's, a, it's a genuine aim. We, you know, we want to respect what you're doing help you nudge and small gains across 88% of the island could be fantastic for what we're trying to do as a, as a wildlife trust. Um, so plan for this evening. David's going to give a presentation. Um, I'll let him tell you more about that. He's going to go into some of the detail and then we're going to get onto a Q&A session and, and the question and answer session, um, I'll act as the compare. There'll be David, we've got uh, representatives of DEFA, we've got Caroline in the room that's also acting as a consultant working with David on the Agri-Environment Scheme. Um, and there's a few others I might pull in with the microphone. Um, so I'm going to hand over to David, David's presentation, Q&A, etc. Um, we are recording the event, and the reason we're recording the event is that we're keen that anyone that can't come tonight has got a chance to watch it. Um, so just be aware of that if you're asking questions, but please don't let that put you off. <laughs> okay, um, without further ado, I'll pass over to David for his presentation. And again, thank you for coming. Good evening everyone. Can everyone hear me okay down at the back? Uh, we've got loads of seats up at the front if anyone else arrives or, or wants to, to, to rearrange and um, I'm aware that I'm the only thing holding you back from the buffet so uh, I'm uh, conscious of the time and I'll get through this as fast as we can. Plenty of opportunity for questions later. Uh, so firstly as Lee said thank you very much for coming tonight. It's been great over the last two months to meet so many of uh, Manx farmers um, and we've been working flat out to get our message and uh, information about this scheme out to, to farmers. Tonight is a really important uh, part of that. Um, so thank you very much for taking uh, your, your time uh, to come here tonight. Okay, uh, I've put the wording together for this slide and for me this is what Manx Wildlife Trust's aim and ambitions for this scheme is and I don't think there'll be anyone in this room who would disagree with anything um, that's on that slide there. Uh, We've already got a beautiful and fantastic island uh, and we need to cherish that. This scheme is finally rewarding Manx farmers for the role that you have in looking after our landscape and looking after our wildlife. Um, 
Would we like more wildlife? Of course we would. Who wouldn't? Uh, do we know that things are difficult for farmers? Yes, they are. So this scheme is all about um, incremental tiny changes that farmers can make on their farms to those field corners, to the little damp patches, you know, tiny tweaks to farming agricultural practices. That if all farms on the Isle of Man do those, we'll, we'll have an absolute catastrophic positive change for nature. Uh, the key points for the scheme um, are that this is a Manx scheme. Uh, while certain elements have taken in best practice from uh, around the world, uh, it is bespokely Manx and that th this is our scheme and one of the great benefits from that is that we can make this a really, really good scheme. We would not be involved in it if we didn't think it was a good scheme and it's got huge amounts of potential for the future. Uh, it's our scheme and it's ours to improve and it's ours to own. Uh, it is only open to active farmers. So the, the money that's involved in the scheme, the two million pounds, is only for the Manx farming community and not for other landowners on the Isle of Man. It's completely voluntary, and this is a really key thing. Nobody under this scheme will make you do anything. They'll, nobody will stop you doing anything you're doing already. If you want to in, engage with the scheme and join it, you can. We won't force you to. It's all island. The Isle of Man has had an agri-environment scheme before that was capped at 30 farms. This is now open to all 353 Manx farms. So this is a, a landscape scale approach to farming support. Uh, and it's enduring. So while we've got a new government coming in, and who knows uh, what, what a new government might uh, choose to do, if we look off island around the British Isles and even into Europe, we can see that farming support everywhere is going down the public uh, goods, uh, sorry, public money for public goods route. So the timing is good for the island. Uh, and it's an annual scheme, so each year will run in isolation from the 1st of April to the 31st of March. So you can claim um, for several years for certain initiatives and also you can choose to do one initiative one year and it won't mean that you're duty bound to do that for, for, forever. So what the scheme is not about, uh, the scheme is not about turning Manx agriculture back to it, how it was in the 1930s. That's a photo of my family's place um, in Lonnon. That, that's totally unachievable. You know, we're not trying to achieve that. Um, it's not compulsory and it's not binding. So if you enter into the scheme, it does not mean that the land that's in the scheme will not be able to be used for anything else in the future. It's not replacing the agricultural development scheme. The two schemes are going to run in tandem. It's not about rewilding. It's not about land abandonment. In fact, land abandonment is prohibited under Isle of Man agricultural support. Um, the scheme is not closed. No one is too late. Anyone can join at any time and we're asking for this year for any applications to be in by the 28th of February to allow some time for them to be processed and the, the plan is that all uh, payments will be received bolted on to your April ADS payment next year. It's not retrospective. So any work that's happened on your farm in the past, any dubs you've put in, any trees you've planted, are not eligible for retrospective payments. However, the scheme did formally start on the 1st of April, so it is retrospective to a point, and that point is the 1st of April 2021. So if you've sown a clover lay this year, then that will be eligible in retrospect. And the scheme is not finalised. Um, we see it very much as an enduring thing, uh, and we are seeking continuous improvement. Uh, even within the nature conservation community, our understanding of nature and of conservation um, and agriculture it, is continually uh, developing. And with new uh, threats all the time, like climate change, they'll, they'll continue to develop. So when you read the handbook, and one of the reasons we ask you to use the online version is it's going to be constantly changing. In fact, just since the, we've joined the scheme, two, two new initiatives have been added to the handbook. So that there's more, more to come for farmers. Okay, so why you're all really here is this. Everyone is aware that the ADS payment went down this year quite significantly and you saw that in July when you received uh, the payments come through. Uh, upland farmers down 37% is the headline, a headline figure, in the lowlands down 17.5%. Everyone's talking about this, we're aware and there's a lot of negativity out there about this. However, there is an extra £1 million for farming support this year. So these reductions have funded £1 million for the Agri-Environment Scheme and Government have offered another £1 million towards the Environment Scheme. So if you're willing to invest the time and effort to understand this scheme more, to implement it on your farm, 
this year you could actually earn more in terms of your farming support than you did last year. And I'll go through some examples about that, how, how that can be the case. So why is the Manx Wildlife Trust involved in farming support? Um, it is uh, quite contradictory in many ways, but that's an old way of thinking that we're willing to change, as, as Lee started with. Uh, so this is some work we've done recently to look at the, uh, the 500 species of na native plants on the Isle of Man. And I won't go through these figures, you know, we can talk about these later and we'll make these available online. Uh, but you can see 76 of these uh, are in trouble. Uh, 45, the black ones, have been lost from the Isle of Man and are now locally extinct in, in recent times. Uh, not all of these are farmland, of course. This is, we're talking salt marshes, we're talking in the hills, in, in woodlands, uh, in wetlands. So the reason I've put this up is that although the Isle of Man is a fantastic place to live and to work and it looks wonderful, if you start to delve into, literally into the weeds, then there are things that we can improve on. And that's everyone on the Isle of Man. Uh, Manx BirdLife have recently done a similar bit of work, the Birds of Conservation Concern, and they've similarly found that of 180 Manx bird species, we've lost 14 that no longer breed, one of which was last year. Uh, 48 species are red-listed and in, in difficulty. And unfortunately, and of course the blame is no one's, um, and the, what this scheme is about is about making improvements and giving uh, farmers and land managers the opportunity to, to do these with support. Uh, but you can see here, th these three birds here, they're all farmland birds, uh, but there's loads of things we can do to, to make the prospects of Manx nature better. Uh, this is the red list of Manx birds, so all of these birds on here uh, are in trouble at the minute. Uh, the aim tonight, I'm not going to talk about these, the, we can talk about these later, um, and, and there's some controversy. You, the gulls, that they're decreasing in number, so science tells us. Uh, is that a good thing, a bad thing, a conversation for another night? However, all of these with the yellow arrow are generally considered to be farmland birds or birds of the farmed uplands. So you can immediately see if this scheme works and if the farming community get into this scheme and buy into it, then we can make a huge, huge amount of difference for Manx nature in a really, really positive sense. All right, so here is the old man and this is when we realise this while we're so keen to join uh, the scheme. As Lee said before, the Manx Wildlife Trust has existed for 50 years. In that time we've acquired 25 nature reserves. I hope uh, those of you who have visited some of them will agree they're absolutely fantastic places. Incidentally, most of our nature reserves are farmland. However, when we break it up um, into the Isle of Man as a proportion, in the red at the bottom there, uh, the 0.2% is about half of the calf of man is what we manage specifically for nature's benefit. In the green, about 2% of the Isle of Man are wildlife sites, so they are non-legally protected areas, but that are acknowledged to be important for nature. The legally protected areas, ASSIs, cover about 4%, of which many, of course, are farmland. Manx agriculture is 88% of the island, and then there's a, a bit of housing, of course, on the rest. So what this slide is to indicate is that if we really want to make a positive distant, uh, difference for Manx nature, we have to have the farming community involved in this because essentially you guys own and manage and look after the Isle of Man. So we need to get out of our nature reserve mentality and talk about island-wide changes for nature, for water, for soil health, etc. A, a couple of quick examples. This is the corn bunting. Uh, as its name suggests, a, a typical farmland bird. It went extinct in 1956. Uh, not the fault of Manx farmers at all. This is tiny, tiny changes in our climate um, made the Isle of Man no longer suitable for this bird. Where it is currently found is on the east coast of England, where farming practices are in many ways um, deplorable when you compare them to, to Manx agriculture. So it goes to show sometimes there's nothing that we can do with, with nature. However, here's the Yellowhammer. It was last proved, proven to breed on the Isle of Man in 2005. Um, and the last confirmed sighting was on the Calf of Man, which might not have even been a Manx bird in 2009. Um, lots of complicated reasons why this uh, bird has disappeared, uh, but the, the loss of winter stubbles, the underseeding of winter stubbles, increasing uh, artificial inputs, etc., 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 and has resulted in what was once the most abundant, the single most abundant Manx bird 
has, is now been lost from our landscape. Personally, I, I'm a birder. Birds, birds are my thing. I bird all the time. I've never actually seen the Yellowhammer on the Isle of Man, which is quite disappointing. And when you read a, a book from 100 years ago that they were so common, um, it's no one's fault, it's no one's blame. This bird is decreasing all across Europe, but there are things we can do in this scheme to turn the tide. Uh, this bizarre photo here is a freshwater pearl mussel. Uh, so it's not all about birds, there's lots of other things going on. Uh, th this was found in Manx rivers, specifically the Dew, uh, and it was only this year. It's long been thought to be extinct, but it's been proven by DNA and water um, chemical analysis that this species is no longer found uh, in its last stronghold on the Isle of Man. It's, it's Manx extinct, and it's because this species can't uh, deal with really any level of nitrates in water. So while Manx farming is a uh, is fantastic, especially when you compare to farming elsewhere around the world. Of course, there are things that we can improve, and this scheme will give you the tools and, importantly, some of the funding to allow that to happen. Uh, some of you may not be able to read these. Uh, there's repeaters above. Uh, but essentially, the, these are all the things that the scheme could deliver. And again, like I said with the introduction, I think these are all things that everyone in this room wants to see happen on the Isle of Man. We want um, improved soil health for agriculture. We want food security uh, and we actually, th this scheme is also is not about reducing valuable farmland at all. Uh, we don't want any more extinctions on the Isle of Man. But what we want is nature friendly farming that the two can coexist and thrive side by side and really that, that is what the Isle of Man biosphere is about. The biosphere doesn't prohibit any activities but it's about people, the landscape and nature all living and thriving together. And I, I think it's amazing that it's not every day in a nature conservation organisation a government comes across with £2 million for farming support co-twined co with uh, conservation. And I think this is a wonderful thing that we're doing. Uh, briefly, right, what is the role of Manx Wildlife Trust in this? So our, our role is on farm visits. So I will specifically come, and as will Caroline, to all of your farms. We'll, we'll cover all 353 farms in time and we will offer ecological advice. We will also um, give you advice about the scheme. So we'll tell you what would be a good thing to do on your farm, what wouldn't be a good thing. Lots of people want to plant trees. We'll tell you where not to plant trees. We don't want tre trees on, on a lot of peatland sites, but there's a, a load of areas that are absolutely prime for trees. We'll also give you some ideas, maybe stuff you hadn't have thought about. One of the great things about this scheme is the farmer initiative, where the farmer themselves can suggest anything that's not in the handbook. So we'll talk about these options. We'll also signpost you and give you a, a, assistance on uh, where to find the forms, what needs to go in there, what happens next. And, I say, and we'll provide the ecological assessment for government that nothing done under this scheme will actually have a negative environmental benefit, for example. Well, there have been examples of that in the past, so we're making sure that everything is coherent and is going to be good for nature. A, a bit of myth busting, and I've put this up there, this is some of the concerns that farmers have given me over the last couple of weeks. Um, myself and Caroline, we don't work for DEFA, we're not government officers, we're not field officers, we're not inspectors. When we come to your farm, it's to offer you advice. It is a, a service solely for your benefit. Um, Although I work in nature conservation, I cannot designate ASSIs, so I'm not going to come to your farm, find really nice habitat or rare species and say, this is fantastic, we're going to make this an ASSI. Um, and certainly for rare species, uh, in the past the, there's maybe been a culture that if there's something rare or important on your farm, you dare not tell anyone because of course that made a headache, it stopped you doing this, it stopped you doing that. Actually what this scheme is now saying is please tell us about all the rare things on your farms because it will now give you money. And if you've got rare things, it's because the way that you're managing the farm as it is. And absolutely, that's something we want to celebrate and reward you for. And also, it's something we want to tell others potentially about, if you're happy, so that they can come and see you know, what, what works. Um, however, when we're on the farm, we're, it's basically you, we're treating you as clients. So if you want to keep things quiet, if you don't want us to tell any, anyone about anything on your farm, then we're duty bound to, to, to do that. But right, moving on now uh, to the nitty gritty, um, you're, you're all here to hear about what you can do on your farms. So the, the current handbook, uh, and there it is on the right, it, it's been updated several times, including most recently in July. So please, if you can, refer to the online version because there's more initiatives coming. But at the minute, there are, there are 40 ways that you can either increase farm productivity or help nature or ideally do both on your farm at the minute. So there's a fantastic amount of flexibility in here, including the Farmer Initiative, the ultimate 
tool and flexibility. And, and this is making sure that there is something for every farm in every situation on the Isle of Man. Um, I'm not going to talk about all 40 because we'll be here till next Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to rattle through them. Come and ask me questions later. I'll just talk about some headlines. Uh, so you can create permanent ha uh, habitats, woods, dubs, you know, these are all a given, the, the obvious stuff. Out of interest, this is a dub I created in 2007 on my family's uh, land. And we, we dug a, a really great big hole with a digger, left it looking like a, something from no man's land on the Somme. And actually, we've done nothing with it since. And now it's a fantastic place for wildlife. And it's also a fantastic place for agriculture because the stock in drought are now being able to drink out of there, which is not, not a bad thing. Right. Lots of text on here, I apologise for that. These are what we're calling transient habitats. This is basically uh, arable land uh, for all intents and purposes. But you can see there's loads of different options uh, that you can do on here. And again, I won't talk all through tonight. It's really important for each farmer to go home and read the handbook. That's where all the information is. And actually, I can't tell you anything that isn't in the handbook because that, that's the Bible for, for, for this scheme. Um, I'll just quick pick one um, thing out of here. Uh, is winter stubbles. I'm going to talk about them a bit more later. The timing is obviously right for winter stubbles. Lots of interest. Lots of farmers already do this already. So for, for very few or no tweaks to what you're already doing, you can receive farming uh, in increased support. It will support existing habitats and farmers get very excited when I talk about this that someone is now going to give you financial support to fix all those stone walls that have been falling down for years and that you haven't had the time, inclination, money or effort uh, to, to go and look after. Um, you can remove non-native species from your land and you'll get government support to, uh, to do it. And for all the gaps in, and the rub rubbed out areas uh, of hedges, we'll now provide the funds uh, to fix those up, recognising how important for wildlife all these farmland features, all these man-made features are. Uh, we're also looking to uh, enhance water protection uh, on the Isle of Man, and a, and a great example of this, uh, I hope he doesn't mind if I jump out, um, Ian here at the front, uh, Balgene in Lonnon, uh, there was an area where the cattle were causing a bit of damage to a water course. So Ian's approached us and we've come up with a plan for a farmer initiative that is going to remove that immediate area uh, from agriculture to protect the water. But there's, of course, there's a, there's a loss of farm income there, there's income for GOM, but money will be provided for those. And also uh, new fencing is going to be provided. And because the stock are going to lose access to the water where the damage is happening, a, a new water um, supply system is being installed. So it's quite a complex system. But this goes to show what we can do under this bespokely Manx scheme under a farmer initiative. And of course in Laxey, we've got considerable flood threats there. Uh, the river goes into a marine nature reserve. So there's all these ticks and benefits that are all coming together. <clears throat> uh, further agricultural in initiatives, no one's going to go organic. Uh, there might be a couple and, and we're not suggesting that you go organic, but for people who are already default um, or organic by default or are already certified, we'll recognise financially the income foregone and the wildlife benefits from there. Uh, Liming is on here, quite a motive subject. Uh, work is in progress to um, increase the eligibility for lime that can be used on Manx farms. And this is a major winner for, for Manx farms, especially, well, all Manx soil almost is acidic. Um, and, and liming has fantastic benefits for agriculture, of course, you all know that. Also has fantastic benefits for wildlife. More lime means more earthworms, means more curlew. So the scheme will support you in that endeavour. Uh, and then there's a couple of catch-alls. Um, wildlife boxes, essentially bird boxes, bat boxes, bee boxes. Who doesn't want more nesting birds on the farm? The scheme will pay. Educational visits, this is one of the few areas where you can really, really profit from the scheme. Um, many farms over many years have brought children to the farms to learn about uh, agriculture and it, more important now than ever before where f uh, children, most children, are just so detached from where their food comes from. Um, you can now get paid to do this on your farm and we've had some really fantastic examples of farmers uh, doing this this year, bringing the children in and, and making money from it. Of course, uh, Upland Stewardship, uh, so the, the, the photo here indicates a recent um, government and working, um, sorry, recent initiative with the government working with the Upland grazing tenants to repair some of the degraded heat, uh, peat up on Benny Pot. Uh, so that there's so much that, that can be done under this scheme uh, that's going to benefit agriculture 
and, and the environment. Um, now the fire initiatives, you might not be able to see it in there in the dark, but this is anything, anything you can think of, please come to us. And if it's got an agricultural benefit or an environmental benefit, likely most of them will have both of those benefits, come and speak to us and we'll talk through. I've put some examples up here, so, uh, and these are things that we hope will come into the handbook in the, in the near distant uh, future, sorry, in the near future. And the more farmers want to do these, the, more, um, the quicker they'll come in the handbook. So if you have existing hay meadows, traditional species rich hay meadows, like you can see on the photo there, if you have them already, tell us about them. Tell us exactly how you've managed them for the last couple of decades. Tell us how you want to manage them and we'll recognise for the work that you do on there. If you want to expand them, fantastic. If, you want to, if you've got a field that's, that's kind of a bit naff, a bit useless for agriculture, let's make it into a hay meadow. That's what we've done with our reserves, most of which, um, well, in fact, all of our hay meadows have been created from scratch. Uh, there's a photo of one of them there. Um, if you've got permanent pasture, permanent pasture is really important for biodiversity. It's really important for carbon. It's a bit naff for agriculture in a lot of places. But if you've got anthills on your farm, that suggests that you've got some really, really healthy and important soil. Yes, it's a bit naff, but we'd rather pay you to recognise for the permanent pasture and the anthills rather than getting you in reseeding it with Italian ryegrass. Um, hedge laying's not in there, but lots of, of people want to hedge lay. It's not considered to be a very Manx practice. However, over the last 20 or 30 years, lots of hedges have been laid and hedge laying does have proven wildlife benefit and it ha has farming benefits too for making thicker hedges, uh, more protection for animals, more protection for crop. And if you work really hard at it, they can be stock proof without pig wire too. Uh, we don't want to lose lots of agricultural land in this scheme. One of the best ways we can do that is the creation of parkland. So parkland is where you have mature, well in time mature, but standalone isolated trees in pasture. Uh, Balakilligan, not far from here, is a, is a good example of that. So you're planting trees for loads of benefits, for carbon, biodiversity, I'm sounding like a stuck record here, uh, but you're not losing any agricultural land. Uh, Rewetting for curlew, not for everyone, but if you've got an area where the field drains are knackered, they're not working, you're happy to give up the ghost, well let's talk about it and let's see how we can do it to benefit curlew. And when I'm going to farms, people are telling me what, what I'm telling them, they're agreeing that people realise there's not as many curlew around anymore. People are asking me where have the lapwing's gone. But by those, those little damp corners that we're fighting, fighting, if you're happy to, and again, nobody will make you do it, but we can make these areas wetter for, for multiple benefits. Um, chuff management on the Isle of Man, we've got 28% of the combined Isle of Man and UK total of chuff on what's really a, a very small area. And that's something we need to celebrate. And the reason we have so many chuff is because of Manx farming. What they need is they need a, a year round, really short sward height um, that is full of invertebrates and they need lots of dung on the land where they're finding the invertebrates. So our lowland pasture on permanent pasture is just fantastic for chuff. They also need sea caves, old daltons, and they need sandy beaches in winter full of seaweed where they're gonna find insects. We've got all of those things on the Isle of Man. So this scheme will reward you for those areas on the island that are of really, really good importance for chuff. And the way we'll do that is through a farmer initiative and come up with a chuff grazing management plan. At woodland pasture, when we're planting trees, we're not losing agricultural land. Even if you're going for a block of trees, they just need to be fenced off for five, six, seven years, whatever it takes for those trees to be suitably established and then get the sheep in. The other man was once completely covered in forest and we know from the specimens of giant deer in, in the Manx Museum, it was covered in herbivores too. We don't have any of those now. So actually getting animals into newly created woodland, we're mimicking many natural processes that would have been around the Isle of Man after the Ice Age. Uh, loads of farms have got important archeology span on. So if it's the suitable thing to do, let's fence them off. Or in some places, actually fencing in the 70s was the wrong thing and we need some limited grazing in these areas to keep down bracken, to keep down brambles. So if you've got important archeological sites and we can look at the old maps, Let's talk about it. Let's work out how that can benefit your farm business. What I'm going to do now, that's a very quick run through for the 40 things. And remember, these are 40 things and counting. More is to come. Uh, so on the winter stubbles, as an example, headline figure, and I hope you can see this, but uh, last year you got £78 an acre. This year, only 64 That's what everyone's focusing on, all the negative side of things. However, under the winter stubbles payment, 
Uh, and of course, there, there are caveats in there. It has to stay as winter stubble, for example, to the 15th of February. You can't burn the stubble. You can't intensely graze it. You can't spread, uh, spread slurry while it's in stubble, but you can get 58 pounds for that. If you go down the traditional spring cropping route as well, and these things can all be combined, um, Again, caveats, there's two uh, hundred weight maximum for fertilizer per acre, no, fertil uh, no fungicides, no insecticides, but you can get hundred pounds if you're willing to make a tiny change, or for many of you, probably no change whatsoever. Um, by filling in a nutrient management plan, many of you have got them already. A lot of these things are covered in farm assurance. A manure management plan, you've all got them. Uh, by doing some number crunching and looking at your arable cost of production, essentially, how much are your inputs costing? and how much are you getting at market, uh, a pest management plan, all these other paperwork um, initiatives. And as you can see on there, potentially on your winter stubbles, you can get considerably more than you got per acre last year. Another caveat, this is capped at the first 10 acres of winter stubble and then the payment reduces. So every farmer needs to go away and have a look at the handbook and work out the maths behind them. But this is just a quick and dirty example of how you could on some areas of your farm make more than you did last year and, and there's more so you can get paid for cutting hedges only once every two years or ideally once every three years um, you'll get paid 50% of the costs for, so for soil sampling you can get paid for the lime if you're already organic or going to go organic for the conversion for organic 71 pounds uh, per year conservation headlands is not spraying the, out, uh, the outer six meters of your farm. You'll get paid a hundred pounds an acre for that. So if I was actually to add all of these in as well, the numbers are stacking up. And this is because there is an, a million pound of extra funding available for the scheme this year. On lowland grassland, um, last year 78 pounds, this year 64. However, all these paperwork exercises as before um, are, are eligible uh, and the headline figure is still not great. It's still showing that it's down um, 70 pounds an acre this year, even if you do all those other things against 78 last year. But remember, there's the hedge management, the soil sampling, the liming. Liming is so important for increasing productivity. Um, if you want to reseed rotational land with clover, 30 pounds an acre for that. If you want to put in a drought resistant herbal lay, 30 pounds an acre. If you want to go organic, 30 pounds an acre. Um, Winter fodder is, is in there, and, and that is even before we factored in any farmer initiatives that you might want to do. And this is just on, on the fields. What about the dubs? What about the trees? What about uh, other little corners in the farm where you might want to, to get some return? And then on, on the uplands, um, 13 pounds last year, eight pounds this year. However, by joining the Upland Stewardship Scheme, and for this year, all we're asking for that is a, a habitat management plan to ask you really, what, what, what work have you done on the hills? Where have you bruised the bracken? Where have you burnt the heather? Uh, where have you flailed the gorse? Um, and looking at, we want to collect all of that information to work with stakeholders, work with the Upland farmers in the future, to work out hopefully when more money is available for things like climate change mitigation, where are we actually going to implement these um, on the Uplands? So you can see you can make the same, same amount or even more this year and not even factoring in any other initiatives that you might do. Okay, uh, the process, lots of confusion over this. Uh, so I'll go through this a, a bit in depth. Um, the most important thing, and if you take one thing away from tonight is this, please go and read the handbook. It has more information than I have in my brain in there and it's the Bible for this scheme. Uh, once you've read that handbook, um, and everyone got a paper copy of the guidelines in the ADS, so you'll have it at home. Please, now the nights are drawing in, you know, grab a cuppa or a whiskey and, and have a read through uh, and work out what you might want to do on your farm. If you've already got ideas, this is where you can arrange a farm visit. My email address is down at the bottom. Um, you can speak to me, you can speak to Caroline, you can speak to John, you can speak to Andy, speak to any of us and we'll, we'll work out a farm visit um, and, and we'll come and speak. However, you don't need a farm visit. If you know exactly what you want to do or it's relatively straightforward or you're all over it and you know the handbook word for word, go straight for the application form. So all of the application forms are available now on the DEFA website. To find that, simply Google Isle of Man Agri-Environment Scheme and it'll take you straight to the page uh, for the application forms. We had lots of intention to apply forms in earlier this year. However, it is just an intention to apply form, except for one or two initiatives where it is also the application form. Confusing, I know, and we're working to make a, a more clear and streamlined and efficient system for next year. 
Uh, but the application form, forms can come in absolutely right now. And remember, you can backdate anything to the 1st of April if you've already done it. And please don't wait till the end of the year. The end of the scheme year is the 31st of March. So the sooner you get these in on these cold and dark nights, the, the better. And the sooner you get them in, um, certainly if it's a big bespoke project, then, then uh, part payments or complete bespoke one-off payments can be uh, issued within the scheme year so you don't have to wait till April. Once the application forms have been sent through to DEFA, um, then that might trigger a farm visit. If you're wanting to plant trees, realistically, I want to see everywhere where trees are being planted to make sure we're not losing valuable chuff grazing land or trees aren't going to be planted on peat. Um, so we just want to make sure that it's a good thing uh, and talk through what you've put in the application form. Uh, that's then my cue to, to say to DEFA that this is a sensible thing to do, let, let, let's go forward with it. DEFA will then issue formal approval in writing to you and for some of the schemes where it says 50 to 100% of your costs are eligible, at this time DEFA will tell you exactly how much um, you'll receive for the scheme. Uh, once you've had the written approval, you can then go on and conduct your initiative. And this year, there's plenty of wiggle room. So, for example, if your fields are in winter stubble right now, that's absolutely fine. You'll get a payment for it as long as they're eligible under the scheme. You didn't have to have the paperwork in before a certain deadline. Everything's been uh, delayed this year, of course. So the 28th of February is the only deadline we're working to. Uh, once your initiative has been conducted, then um, you'll submit a claim form that DEFA will send out to you with the approval and that's to say it cost me this or I, I've done X, Y and Z, left the winter stubbles, I would like my payment now and payment will be made as I say in April next year or sooner if requested for, for larger bespoke projects. We're almost there, bear with me. Um, right, some of the feedback that I've been getting from visiting farms uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and one of my jobs is to, to send that feedback on to DEFA, so I, I, I'm listening and we really want to make this scheme good, we really want to improve it so, so it's easy to use because that, that's how it will be a success. Uh, so one, one of the, the concerns is that payments are in arrears and therefore, as I've just said, there is now the option for bespoke one-off or part payments within the year if a large expenditure is involved. Um, it's a bit arable heavy, yes we're aware, but arable, of course the costs are so much more in many cases on arable and, and realistically um, there's so much more you can do for wildlife on, on arable land. But we are looking at other ways for grassland and upland farmers, chuff management uh, plans are, 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 are one of those. Uh, it doesn't really recognise yet existing habitats uh, and I'm, I'm going to do a lot of work over winter to, to make sure that, that, that that's in the scheme in the future. So if you've already got orchid meadows, you can't create them. They're already there. So recognising further stuff that's uh, good on, on farms. There's a bit of concern about longevity. Of course, the backdrop is the previous agri-environment scheme was scrapped. Um, however, it would be a very brave politician these days to scrap anything uh, with an environmental label on it, especially when we see that farming everywhere is, is going down this route. If anything, and this is just my personal opinion, there might be more money for, for environmental initiatives on farms in future. And, and we're aware the paperwork burden is very high. 40 initiatives, there's 28 different bits of paperwork. Uh, please just bear with it this year. It's not perfect. Uh, we, we will continually improve the scheme to make it easier for you as the, the users uh, there. But just please bear with us this year. A bit, a bit of progress um, to, to end on a high. Uh, so the, the handbook is already being updated. It has uh, herbal lays went in in July, uh, a really fantastic option that people are starting to, to experiment with. Uh, between myself and Caroline, we've had contact with 116 of 353 registered farms. We can't get around everyone all at once. Don't worry, there's no immediate deadlines. We'll get there. Um, please contact us and we'll come and see you. Uh, just personally alone, uh, I've given advice on farms covering over 20,000 acres of land, which is 15% of the Isle of Man, so that the scope for positive change is just, is just huge. Um, and so far, it, uh, in terms of what's been indicated on the intention to apply forms, farmers are looking to do 2,235 distinct things on farms this year. So it's clear already, as, as is obvious in the room here, that farmers are really looking to engage in this scheme. Um, Joe Crellin, sorry, 
Uh, Joe has got the, the, the trophy for uh, creating the first new habitat on the Isle of Man under this agri-environment scheme. So here you can see quite a modest little dub. Uh, size is not important. Uh, so for this dub, that will be fantastic for frogs. It'll be fantastic for dragonflies and damselflies, for rare plants uh, in an area of the Northern Plain known for, for plants. So this is to indicate that things are already happening on the Isle of Man. We now have one more wetland that we didn't have last year, and there's a whole scutch of wetlands uh, still to come. So, so things are happening now. Please get those application forms in. Um, Brian, Brian's farm, Silly Moose, 180 children visited Brian's farm in three days. It was manic. Uh, I was there to share the pain, but it was really rewarding because we spoke to children who thought eggs were made in factories, who thought that cows drank milk, and they had no idea. And they left that farm with a really good impression of the hard work that goes into producing our food on the Isle of Man and how important farming is for looking after the island that we love um, and enjoy. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Some of the upcoming updates, as I said, existing habitats, we really want to look at ways that we can support you for what you're doing already. Uh, this will involve, you, you know, if you've got important areas, it'll involve coming up uh, between myself and you with a, a, a management agreement, which essentially is always going to reflect what you've, what you've already done in the past. <clears throat> Uh, I want to do a bit more work on curlew, lapwing, chuff, orchids, things that we really, really want to support on the Isle of Man. If you have an area that has orchids in, it's not just good for the sake of the orchids, it's good for all sorts of wildlife, for invertebrates, for water quality, for soil, for carbon. Uh, and I, I want more in there about existing meadows um, and about permanent pasture, because that's what the chuff is here on the Isle of Man for. <clears throat> so plenty more to come over the winter. Uh, so that's me finished now, that, 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 that's all I've got to say. Uh, we're going to go into a question and answer session, um, which will run till about half eight when the buffet will be open. And then I say we're, we're here all evening to take any questions that you have. Uh, Joe Cronin, at the Gilka, um, we have a lot of permanent pasture and um, we grow wheat for Laxey Mill. Um, I'm quite happy to um, uh, feed birds on the stubbles but it has to be very small seed, otherwise uh, we'll be invaded with um, jackdaws and crows. But I'm, I, I'm finding it difficult to find someone who will supply me with bulk bird seed of the right size. Where do I go? How do I get it? I've not heard that issue. So can I just have a quick show of hands? Do, do, does anyone else agree with that, that try to get Small bird seed and having problems getting that small bird seed. This might just be you, Joe, that's tried it. So I'm going to, who'd like to have a bash at that one? David? That? <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Um, I, I won't directly answer the bird seed question, but that comes up, um, it highlights lots of issues. So on the Isle of Man this year, we're going to struggle to get enough trees. We can't get hedge plants. There's only one hedge layer on the Isle of Man who sat here in the audience. Uh, we don't have many fences. All the diggers are on Douglas Prom. We haven't got any dry stone wallers. So while what I've presented is fantastic, all these things you can do, they will be, many of them, difficult to do this year. However, now that this scheme exists, that's going to start a groundswell um, of, of, of new opportunities. So for example, there are already Manx people looking to make bird boxes out of Manx, uh, Manx timber. Uh, that, that will be eligible for this scheme rather than you just buying it from, from a website across. Um, so this year there's, there certainly will be issues exactly like you've highlighted, but if I'm a supplier of birdseed on the Isle of Man, I'll be looking at that <coughs> handbook and working out exactly what I can sell uh, for farmers. So yeah, please, again, bear with us with that. Uh, wildflower seeds is another one similar. We, we, Max Wildlife Trust used to supply wildflower seeds through Wildflowers of Man, and we don't. That, that project ended. So currently, there's lots of people buying seed from across that's not Max provenance, but it's also potentially not the right species ratio for the Isle of Man. So that's another thing that we're looking at. If there's enough demand there, there are solutions to these things. So I think it will be, as David says, it about demand and, and who wants these things, and then we'll try and help. Um, next hand. Thank you. Uh, Keith Carush, Fowler and Mackle. Um, just like to thank David for a very positive presentation. Um, got a couple of queries. 
Uh, one, a simple one about trees. Um, he's already told us elsewhere that established tree stands don't qualify in any shape or form. But if you plant trees now, are you going to get subsidy in perpetuity? Or is it going to be a cut off so you chop the trees down again in seven years' time uh, to, to get back to some acreage payment? And I'm sorry that my second point is quite a volatile one, but the whole of the government and the Wildlife Trust pay lip service to conserving bird species. Meanwhile, supporting hen harriers so that we all know full well where the species are being killed off, the hen harriers that the government and yourselves have encouraged. So I just can't see how you can put the stuff up and say, we are intent on uh, conserving bird species. Yep. Um, I'm going to try and spread this a little bit. So I might come to you on the, the bird species. Um, do you want to pick up on the first question? I'm looking at Defa. Thank you. Um, hi, Keith. So my understanding of the scheme is um, you will receive 10 years payments on that acreage for the trees, so when you're turning over to plant trees. And at the end of the 10 years, there's a hope there will be a scheme there that will compensate you in the form of carbon credit payments or some other way to mitigate what you've lost on direct support. Does that make sense? Who will guarantee it? No, no, there's no guarantees. No guarantees. Um, no go. There's no guarantees in, no guarantees in any of it, is there? But that's, that's the intention and that's the way the schemes are looking across Britain, Europe, and the rest of the world. Does that answer the question on the trees? Sorry? Does that answer the question on the trees? Uh, absolutely not. <coughs> well, who which bit am I missing? Because you, why bother to plant trees if you're not going to get paid for it? Um, okay, okay, but do, do you understand where the logic behind the tree planting comes from and where the potential income stream comes from in the future? Sorry, I can't hear you on that mic. Do you understand where the potential income stream comes from in the future to mitigate tree planting? You said, do you understand what? Where the potential income stream comes from in the future to mitigate for the tree planting. No, I don't. So, do you understand the carbon credit scheme being paid to sequester carbon to mitigate climate change? So, is that, is that written in for forever? The scheme doesn't exist yet, but there is an intention there that something will. Um, there's an expectation, certainly, across the whole of the world not just in the yeah. yeah. I've had a lot of conversations about tree planting and, and carbon credits and carbon offsetting and, and another one of our colleagues who's worked a lot on this with an intern and we've had conversations with big corporates that are looking at this. There is, as I understand it, no guarantee, um, but there's quite positive. So to be pragmatic, what would I think in your shoes? Well, I might think, first of all, if I've got areas where actually I could plant trees, and frankly I'd like to plant trees, then let's get the money and plant trees there. You, you may then say the second one is that there's an area where you think you might, but you might keep it for farming and for seven years it's not worth it. Well maybe you've got to take a gamble in the short term. But everything I'm hearing from the government and everyone else is that the, the solution for carbon credits to pay you longer term is something that's been developed. And, and I know from conversations I've had lots of people are trying to develop that so there is a longer term income because we don't want to work on projects where people plant trees and cut them down either after seven years so i'd say if there's easy areas plant them and other ones you might have to take a punt in the short term but hopefully in the medium term that that, that the finance the finances will will stop do you want to take the hen harrier question yep. uh, thanks keith uh, just just one quick thing on the woodland uh, as i said uh, you'll continue to get your ads payment on any new woodland for 10 years which is a good positive and that woodland can still be used for agriculture. You can still get the stock in there. Uh, in the, in, and in the future, you could use um, not just wood pasture, but you can also use the, the trees for, for natural products. Uh, so there are other options uh, for, for, for the woodland. Of course, it's difficult for anyone here to make any offer when 10 years from now, they'll be we've been through two different governments, of course. Uh, in terms of hen harriers, so on the Isle of Man, we've got about 35 pairs of hen harrier. 
Uh, the highest we, we, we've had or supported is about 47 pairs, so that the hen harry numbers are in decline on the Isle of Man at the minute, although not uh, catastrophically. Um, the, in, in England, um, there are about three pairs of hen harrier. Uh, some years there are none. Last year was not too bad. Uh, so when you think of the size of England compared to the size of the Isle of Man, the hen harrier population we have here is not without difficulty uh, for the impact that has, but it is of vital international importance. So it's one of the key species, the top species that we have on the island. Uh, there are benefits from the hen harriers. Yes, they do kill and eat small birds. It's in their nature. But they, they will also take some of the birds that, that are, are not so fantastic for agriculture. <coughs> and while they do generally focus on the smaller birds, they will take rooks, they will take wood pigeon, things that f the farmers generally don't want on their land uh, too. But it's interesting, as an ongoing, I think, um, national conversation could be had about the role of predators on the Isle of Man and also non-native species. Uh, but thank you for highlighting that. Um, and there's certainly there's nothing in this scheme that's looking to bolster hen harriers. Um, Keith, I've just said, and say all the farms I've visited, some don't want to do no tree planting, but there's others that are so passionate about it. Um, they're putting areas of their field that are next to existing woodlands or <coughs> wet corners, um, and they're really, really excited. <coughs> and as a voluntary option, you can do it or you can, can't do it if you don't want to. So it's there if you like to. Um, and there are people that are just loving, the, very, very excited about future brings more trees on their farm. Thank you. Next, next hand. Yeah. Um, I think we we'll probably all agree that the scheme is less rewarding for the grass-based livestock sector. How would you, sort of after, as the scheme evolves, how would everybody see that it could benefit that sector on the island? Is it, is, you know, there's a large per sort of percentage of agriculture on the island man is grass-based livestock sectors. I'll ask everyone to chip in on that. So we'll, we'll start at this end of the line. It's going to come down to productive capacity, isn't it? So if we're focusing on improving soil health, they will generate more grass growth, more growth of dry matter for livestock to eat. If we mix in a herbal lay, we mix in a clover mix, we mix in a winter fun mix. It's going to make that land more productive. So although we're losing some of that direct support, there's a big benefit to your average farmer. Um, we do want to perhaps bring together a focus group just on grassland over the winter, but that's probably a separate piece of work. So part of the agriculture scheme has got education in there, and within that education, there's a knowledge exchange program, and we've just uh, <coughs> signed a contract with ADAS to deliver knowledge exchange programme going forward. Hopefully they're coming across a road meeting on the 16th of November, but yet to be confirmed. And so by us investing in that, that's about investing in helping people improve their productivity, which helps them improve their income. We've got things like that in soil health, carbon and carbon registration is all part of that. So we haven't had an effective government-based advisory service for a long time on that, at least 10 years. We've got this funding in place to do that. So hopefully, part, 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 part of the program scheme is called the in, it's got all the bits and pieces within it, and the education is part of it, so we, the aim of it is to improve people's productivity <coughs> and efficiency, and then they can get benefits out of the income, and then so they have bits of land spare to set aside to run their own initiatives. So. Um, I think probably what I'd say about that is that a lot of the livestock farmers have small areas of cereals, barley, oats for feeding the livestock in the winter. Um, and the arable options are all capped, so so the smaller areas are going to benefit more than the large arable farms. So a lot of the a lot of the livestock farms on the 20 acres of barley, if they go for those arable options, will will carry on benefiting from that. Thanks, Ian. As I said before, uh, lime is fantastic for wildlife, not just for agriculture. Uh, clover is the same. So these are things that are already in the scheme. Uh, and also, just relatively recently, humanity are, are learning how important grasslands are globally for the fight against climate change. But, you know, Chris Neal and MNFU have done some work on this on the Isle of Man. Um, you can do soil sampling, and we're, we're looking at introducing soil carbon baselining under this, this uh, scheme. So, 
the, the, the value and the role that grasslands will play in, in the carbon um, argument is huge. We don't know how that is going to develop yet and this scheme wasn't built as a climate change mitigation strategy, although the, the new government that's about to be formed may, may want to tweak it, who, who, who knows. But certainly, um, especially those permanent pastures, they're really, really important and we'll look to support them in any way we can. I think just following up on what you said there, Dave, that we all need to make sure that this isn't an agri-environment scheme as well, though, but this isn't delivering um, yep. the climate mitigation policies. Agreed. Uh, I, I might chip on that because it's a point that, that's come up. The, the, the Ian's question about it's not about climate miti mitigation change policies. Um, well, yeah, I'll put it out there. We, Max Wildlife Trust, recognise that the agri-environment scheme is is, a, is, a, is, a, is an initiative and there's a pot of money to fund it and there's a climate change team and there's a climate change pot of money and there's an agri-skills development project and there's a pot of money but frankly you know we want to join these dots up. Now my perception and I wasn't here at the time but there has been an agri-environment scheme before that got cut. We don't want this one to get cut so we would say that absolutely the agri-environment scheme is a standalone scheme. We want the money to go to active farmers to help them in doing agri-environment scheme initiatives. But by doing that, undoubtedly, you're going to be helping the climate, so you know the, the, the island's overall climate change mitigation plan. So we should be championing that and saying that the agri-environment scheme is helping with the island's climate change mitigation, not robbing well, Peter to pay Paul. Yes. Delivery. Well, it, indirectly, it will be. It has to be because I think that strengthens the case for why we want to keep it. And if any new minister comes in and starts saying, why do we have an agri-environment scheme? Then I'd want to be saying to that minister, well, part of the reason we have it, because it helps with our climate change mitigation plan. Yes? I'm going to go Brian and Sarah. You just beat you up, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm agreeing with Ian on this. Um, I've been involved with this scheme right from the outset. <laughs> And it was about environment and di diversity of uh, wildlife and plants, etc. Uh, for for the environment, the the climate change mitigation has been added at a very late date to when the rest of the scheme was drawn up. Um, the government have got climate change mitigation uh, consultations and plans developing. And we should be including them on a separate basis to this. I was very concerned at uh, the recent election uh, when the proposed chief minister from our area had in his manifesto that climate change mitigation was going to come about through the agri-environment scheme. Mm -hmm. And to me, the two are not related only in the fact that the spin-off benefits from planting trees or planting clover using lime, there are, admittedly there are spin-off benefits, but that wasn't the reason for having this scheme. Yeah, Brian, sorry, if, I, if, I, if my answer came across different to that, it's a spin-off benefit. Does anyone else want to add to that? I'm very conscious that the climate change plan mitigation is in the Cabinet Office, and the agri-environment scheme is in, in deficit, so they're completely separate government departments. Um, John? Yeah, Brian, I, I completely agree with you, but kind of verging on to policy, and that actual policy in tonight's meeting is about delivering the agri-environment scheme and how people in the room can gain from the current environment scheme. I take your point about climate mitigation. This agri-environment scheme isn't part of climate mitigation. We've got things in there that can help towards it, but it's an agri-environment scheme. But tonight, my understanding was delivery partners explain to guys on the floor how they can actually benefit from the scheme rather than getting a bit involved in the politics of what the Chief Minister said in his, uh, his manifesto about this is agri scheme. That's for a different forum. This is about helping farmers in the room be able to get the benefit from the scheme directly into the pocket. Thank you, John. Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the tenant farmer disadvantaged by this scheme? And if so, are there any plans to improve their access to support? Who wants to take this one first? You look twitchy. Mm -hmm. Quite happy to. Um, quite happy to. Um, it's not something we've looked into in any great detail yet. Um, perhaps it's something we need to take to one side and set up a separate form and look at the numbers behind it and see if anybody is disadvantaged. Then it could be. 
be simple to do the piece of work on. Um, can I say, compared to the situation in the UK, it's completely the opposite actually. The UK have got, when they did their uh, tier 2, tier 1, tier 2 PIMS, which is effectively what we've done, it was opened up to landlords and tenants, and the scheme was run concurrently. So landlords could actually do initiatives on the farm that there's no benefit to the tenant, the tenant had no influence over, and the income went straight to the landlord. This scheme is based on the ADS claimants, the ADS claimant is the active farmer on the land, so they're the person who gains direct benefit from them. Okay, if you're doing something like building a dub or doing some new head uh, woodland planting, we strongly advise that you get the landlord's permission before you do it because it's their land. The person who benefits from the payment is the tenant who's actually farming the land and not the landlord. So it's completely different to the UK. And in my understanding of our current scheme, it benefits the tenant and not the landlord. Yeah, just um, experience of going to farms, talking to farms. Um, in some ways, I agree, some of the tenant farmers are not keen to do the permanent habitat, um, the tree planting, the ponds, unless they've got a good relationship with their um, with the landowners. And sometimes the landowners and tenants are actually working together, and the landowners are actually supporting, and if there's a, a shortfall in payment, they're actually helping. So it depends on the farm and the individual and the relationship with, with the tenant and the landlord. Um, the other initiatives, um, very much from a tenant point of view, uh, work just for, yeah, really, really well. So it's the permanent habitat features that could be an issue, which maybe you to look at a little bit more. Yeah. Hello, Paul. Hi. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I welcome the scheme. Like Brian put in a lot of contributions over the years, having been involved in the original pilot scheme. It was very disappointing when it was withdrawn without any real review. Can I ask, in amongst the timeline that you set out, David, for this year, I didn't see within the timeline any planned review. I mean, this, this is the, the actual year of the rollout, but there needs to be built into that before we get to April a review of this of, of the teething challenges for the industry and for yourselves in helping to deliver uh, a scheme that needs to be built in a, a, some sort of planned uh, review or uh, stop stop and check stop and look at how it's going so that those developments can be then be, be built into the ne next year going forwards. Um, while I'm walking up I know there's a good answer for this so I'll, I'll pass it to David. Uh, thanks, Paul. It, certainly, it's um, th that's something that we absolutely saw in the scheme. That is, a, is a really good scheme. It could, as anything, be improved, and we definitely want to continually improve that scheme. Uh, so, so we said from the outset when we, we put the bid in for for this uh, is that w we would like to do this, and we would also like to help government make it better on a continual basis. Uh, at the minute, myself and Caroline are prioritising getting out around farms on farm visits, um, and I'm desperate to get to all those 353 farms. Uh, I've got loads and loads of ideas. I don't have the, 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 the time at the minute to, to put them on paper, but that will happen over winter. I, I, and certainly my ambition is, and of course it's a government scheme, um, but we're helping them improve it. I would love to see a, a new version of the handbook ready for the next scheme year that in, incorporates many of the farmer initiatives that are, are proving really popular uh, for this year. And just to read, we're on version five of the handbook at the minute, and it's, it's been updated twice this summer. So we're absolutely looking at ways to improve it uh, and take all that feedback in. Thank you. Yeah, I just say, Paul, that um, every week, um, David, myself and, and Deva, we have a, a, a meeting which are minuted um, and we look at all the issues that have come up during the previous week. Um, and so in the winter, we we'll consolidate those all to help move forward. So there's a lot of liaison between ourselves with all the problems that have arisen from when we've had farms. And myself and David are having occasional joint visits as well. So we learn from each other um, and sort of working from the same hip sheet, really. So, um, so it is, we are looking at it, definitely. I appreciate you looking at it, but what, what I'm saying is that there needs to be the opportunity to, uh, timetabled in so that, from a farmer's perspective, if there are challenges or suggestions, 
they, they can be programmed in? I, I think as well, the bit which is probably the really short answer is yes, there is a review and in conjunction with the Wildlife Trust, our uh, delivery people and the NFU, we will get together towards the end of the scheme year, reviewing and moving to New Year. That will happen every year okay. following. Can I just uh, add to that? Yes, within the contract process, there's a review process, annual review process, I think. But we don't do it annually, we do it every week, as has been said here before. The scheme start, the handbook started on the back of a fact packet some over a year ago now, and it's, and it's morphed from that. And we acknowledge that it's not a complete document, it never is going to be. But we've got the fault initiatives, then we've got the family initiatives, and as David pointed out on his presentation, we've got at least six or seven in there already that have grown this last two or three months. So it's about asking, it's, it's never, and my intention wasn't for it, this scheme to be black and white, tablets are done, you must do this, you must have three sheep to the acre or five sheep to the acre, that's not the scheme, it's the scheme to work with farms and the whole point of it is it is flexible and it will adapt to what, what, what you the farmers need and what you can actually deliver for the environment. It's not going to be a black 3,000 page document that says you must do this on the fourth day of the month otherwise you don't get paid. That's not that sort of a scheme but it will evolve, it's designed to evolve. Thank you, John. I think, it's fair, fair I think it's fair to say during the negotiations that was one of the very important factors of the scheme. That it is an evolving scheme, it is fluid, and we will everybody will work together to try and make it work best for the industry. That, as David said, that's, that was a real key thing for my twelve life trust before we, we find the contract. We've been delighted how it's working so far with Defo. We really have. Jim Cayley, uh, from Golden also involved with the Grassland Society. I've been on a few farms lately that have what you're really uh, proposing on the initiative and they've already done it. And you said before, in retrospect to this year, but is there any way you can get payment for, if you've got what you want and um, you, you've always had it, can you get a payment going forward for that? Have you got a specific example? Um, fenced off water, of course, there's people who already fenced off in the past, not, not this year, the years previous, that type of thing. There is loads of, I can think of loads of other areas, but uh, um, little woodland areas where people have um, cleared, cleared them or planted trees and they've done in the past, you know, can that be brought in? Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, what my priority for improvement at the minute is for existing habitats are of vital biodiversity importance on farms. So species rich meadows, species rich garys, uh, anthill meadows, peat bogs, they're the things that we absolutely want to, to include and the way to do that will be under the farmer initiative with a management agreement or management plan about how, how those areas can be preserved and potentially enhanced. So we're going to look at the priority habitats, priority species first. Um, once we do that, then perhaps there'll be a time where we look at existing you know, woodland that's 15 years old that, that isn't of any major importance for really rare or endangered things, but has a, a nice wildlife value too. Uh, but certainly the, the priority for, for the, you know, the, the year ahead is those really important priority species and habitats. Anyone else? I think the glaring, the glaring example there is that you're not starting where we finished before. The, all the land that was in the agri-environmental scheme is not now getting payment. Surely that should be in. So the land that was in the former agri-environmental scheme is getting payment now because it's getting the area payment under the ADS. So it is getting that payment. Also going forward, any land that was in the old agronomy scheme that has beneficial habitat has been assessed by Caroline and David and if the habitat is still there we'll come to an agreement with a management agreement so that habitat can be paid for. So it does it does qualify for it. It's not within the, the twenty the twenty forty issues that are there because we didn't have time to draw up the agri environment handbook and the different prescriptions for the management of different different desirable habitats. That's within the scheme it says in the scheme it says protect and enhance is it in habitat, so they will be supported under the scheme. If you speak to these guys, they'll come out and visit you and they'll come up with a payment rate for those areas that we need to preserve. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, so we've got a copy of the original handbook from the old scheme, and one of my tasks over winter is to go through that and see what, what is really good in there that we could potentially incorporate <coughs> in, in, the, um, in the new handbook. Uh, for, for any farmer who was involved in the old scheme, if you've still got copies of your management agreements, please give them to me because that makes my job really easy. That I can just change the date on them and then we can go down the farmer initiative route um, to, to reflect that those really important sites have been maintained all this time. Head into the back. A question for David, really. Um, we want to prioritise on certain habitats. Why, why are some parts of nature more important than others? Surely it's equally important to each other. I've got a long answer to this. I'm going to bite my lip a bit. Don't be that first go. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I, I guess. Um, uh, a glib answer to that would be, natively, in a natural state, the Isle of Man would be one continuous woodland. So if we <coughs> wanted to be the best for native Manx biodiversity, we would plant trees over the entire of the Isle of Man and have no farming whatsoever. And that's not an answer that anyone in this room wants to hear. Uh, biodiversity <coughs> is all about, and it's in the names in the title, diversity. So the more different habitats we have on the Isle of Man, the more different species of wildlife uh, will we'll benefit from those. Uh, so actually what we have now on the Isle of Man is in many ways better than the native state. We would not have had chuff on the Isle of Man um, a th well, several thousand years ago when it was continuous forest. So what we're looking to support is lots of different types of habitat and actually that works really well with farming because the farming by default creates many different types of habitats even within a year looking at in, in, in the arable construct. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your question. Has anyone got anything else? Um, yeah, I was just going to say also, um, I always find a, a site that's got lots of different species that were all fighting for space, so it's really, really biodiverse, is a much more exciting place, much better. So there's nothing dominating, so none of your docks, your thistles, are, ones that we call invasive weeds, ev everything else has got a chance, and they're all fighting for space. And I think that's really, really important. And that's good for pollinators and um, yeah, I suppose the future is it really. I think that's answered your question. But you were specific about why is one more habitat more important than another? Yes? Yeah, but really answer because I, I just thought so I think it is the question was why is one habitat type more important than another? So I think the, the rarity of it, the species that live within it. You know, there are certain species, some of the bird species that need a specific type of habitat. Grassland is important for chuff. So there are certain habitats that we can relate to certain species. We, um, we typically know the big species and the big plants, but there's I just, um, I was a bit late coming into the meeting. What, what rate of payment do you envisage paying on one of these initiatives? Is it going to be? Um, well, yeah, just, just, just what rate of um, payment are you making on the on the grant side of things? What 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 grant what level of grant? So if this thing could have worked down here. If not, I'll shout. Uh, so it, it is it's difficult to answer that question and you need to look in the handbook because it's different for every initiative. Um, but in general terms what we're looking to do thanks. In general terms, what we're looking to do is cover income foregone uh, and also expenditure made in, in, in environmental uh, initiative. So uh, and one of the benefits of not necessarily always giving a rate is that the rate uh, can be tailored to the specific farmer for the specific initiative. But certainly, I think it goes without saying, we've got £2 million this year, and if this scheme is going to be a success, we need to spend that money. So please get the applications in now. Um, and and it, you know, if you're, well, the sooner you get involved in the scheme, the more likely you are to benefit from the money that, that's available. So, well, 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 then, if, if, so you're going to have approval then. Will you give approval without the, the applicant knowing what rate of support Yeah, get? when the written approval comes in, you'll be given a written um, amount that you'll be paid uh, in there. So, so you won't be going in, in blind. 
uh, <coughs> can I just say that uh, the underground budget will be spent this year? The two million pounds that's in the budget will be spent, and so it's one of these interesting situations that if people don't all join in, those that join in might get a bit surprised. We might actually be paying more than the rates that's had in the handbook this year because we've got undertaking that the budget will be spent this year. We've got that recording, that's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> within this scheme, because if you increase, say, the small bird population, you're going to increase the large bird population as well. What happens then? So in, in terms of rodent control, and um, that's already provided to Manx Farms by DEFA, and that's external, and that will continue. Um, there's ways that you can go about this. I wouldn't do supplementary feeding of farmland birds right next to the farmhouse or next to you know, uh, the, the, the grain store. I do them in far flung places. Uh, and, and in many ways, it, w it will be part of the annual review. We, we'll see what happens. And, and if there are any issues with rooks and, and jackdaw taking larger seeds, then we can, we can change the specified seed mix. Uh, so there's going to be a learning process and some continual uh, improvement in there. Just to pick up on some of this point there, uh, it's, it is a hornet's nest in one respect, but within this scheme there's so much energy being dedicated towards improving uh, habitat, uh, in, and, and that habitat in itself will provide for hopefully enhanced wildlife in protecting bird numbers and so on. Uh, the scheme is bringing, bringing back some support measures for active farmers that were withdrawn, uh, disappointingly, a few years ago by, by previous administration. But one of the measures that was in place going back a number of years was control of uh, certain bird types that were classed as vermin in terms of, and, and at the moment on the island, I, I put forward a proposal, I know it's supported by Manx BirdLife, that we actually have got a population imbalance of certain bird species, and one of the contributing factors of that may be the withdrawal of that support to the industry for controlling certain, certain birds. And can I suggest that during the winter months as this scheme is reviewed, that that's another initiative that is considered possibly for the next year. Thanks Paul. Uh, so one of the initiatives is the, in, the control of non-native species. So if you have non-native species on your land, like the feral grey lag geese that most likely escaped from the wildlife park, like Canada geese, then there are options um, for you under this scheme. Uh, also, uh, there are other, so that there are general licences on the Isle of Man that allow farmers who are experiencing economic loss to control legally uh, birds like your rooks uh, and, and your wood pigeons. Uh, so we, we, we haven't quite looked at, at how that might factor into the scheme for the, for the native um, birds on the Isle of Man, but I, I've made a note and, and we'll, we'll do an internal review, so thank you. Buffet time. It's nearly buffet time. Got two more. This one first, sir, I'll come up to you. Yeah, uh, I can't help feeling that it's uh, more of a public relations exercise than actually achieving much. Um, you know, if, if it's not really linked into sort of climate change, uh, I mean, that's what I think the most people would view to be the benefit of it all. I mean, if we have a whole load more birds like we had years ago, and all these insects are going around, the birds are eating the insects, and then a bigger bird comes along and eats them, eats the smaller birds, it's a bit of a puzzle to see what the real benefit is. I mean, you, you've achieved all these things back into the environment, but what is the actual net result of it all, other than perhaps it might help the climate change? Well, I'm walking 
sure that we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing this unless we believe there was a genuine benefit. Yeah, you, no, but that's... We need to believe. Exactly. Well, I think the first thing is... Well, I can see that now, but, but, but we wouldn't be doing this unless there was, and, and I don't decouple it from the climate change. It's a separate pot of money, but what we're doing for this will benefit that as well. We want to take it. Yeah, again, just speaking from experience, from visiting farmers over the last few months, um, you know, a lot of the farms are very farmers. Um, initially, when I first go, they're a little bit reluctant, a little bit unsure about it. By the end of the visit, they are quite excited, um, and I think they yeah. probably find the same. Um, I don't think I've come across one farmer that's been totally negative about it. They, they're going through the options, appreciating that it's voluntary, and picking out what fits, what they feel right, um, and where they want to go. And I've been to farms that are uh, jumping at the bit about going for having a visit, and other ones that I sort of suggest you have a visit and you slowly bring them on and they start showing you all the wildlife on their farm, take you around. Maybe they never shown anybody else before, but they're really proud about it. Um, and it's, from my point of view, it's actually great to see. Yeah, yeah, but they might, they might be seeing the benefit of it, but you make new money off the before, it's which a, I would be. It is a mix. No, so, some of them uh, appreciate it. They enjoy the wildlife when they're farming. It's, they see it every day, they like seeing it. Um, others, yeah, you're right, some of them. Except groups. Uh, <laughs> others are, yeah, that the main drive is making up the money, but I think there's just many that just, they're living, they're working in that environment all the time, and they're pointing out all sorts of things to me, um, which, yeah, it's, it, it's been quite a surprise, really. Yeah. I definitely echo what Karen said that I'm finding farmers are really proud of the wildlife that they've got on their farm and they're also in many cases concerned and the, the two species that come up to me all, all the time occur to them at that point. Where, where have the lapwing gone? Why have they gone? And what can we do to, to bring them back? Uh, we've got some areas of the island land that are under, underperforming for wildlife. We've got so much more potential uh, and, and this is, as a, it's all about allowing farming to, to continue and hopefully flourish. And, and making some more space uh, for nature by tiny, tiny incremental changes. I'm still puzzled as to what the real benefit is. I mean, the dinosaurs are coming without Well, what's the point in finding climate change? Because none of us will be alive to see the yeah, real impact. As I say, I can yeah. see a connection there that will help that get rid of carbon and maybe reduce well, Unless it's linked to that, it doesn't seem that much better. Well, it's also <coughs> that a, a healthy, vibrant, beautiful landscape full of wildlife is good for human mental health and well-being as well. So, so there's all sorts of, 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 of non-wildlife benefits that can come from the sea, and including clean water, healthy soil, and, and, and clean air. That's a great point, well done. Is there any farmers that would like to say why? Are there any farmers in the room that are actually an applied or that have registered interest for the Open Environment Scheme? So, I'm not going to answer your own question. <laughs> why, why have you applied here? Um, I, think, I think the most exciting thing about it is, is trying to use the scheme to make my farm more productive while benefiting the environment. I think the two can go hand in hand very well in um, increasing productivity on the farm through some of the initiatives, but also in certain areas that can benefit the environment as well. And I think for the scheme to work, the two could have work hand in hand to get profitable farming and environmental measures working hand in hand. Um, um, who else put their hands up? Do you want, would you like to? I know that you're keen on getting this two million spent, and um, if there's not enough people to, uh, you know, use that to get all that money spent, will you be good enough to spread it all out between the rest of us? To be sure, I'll answer this one. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> repeating myself twice on the video today when I said that actually you might be surprised the rates might go up this year and coming down so that we can spend. So we will spread it out to those who have joined in. Yes. And I'd just like to say, I think you're probably one of the first farmers that's put in a lot of applications, so you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs>
the smell's probably coming out. Um, we're really keen that um, we continue this conversation with all of us. Um, so I'm going to look for it. Is the last question now while we're all formally seated? Then we can grab food and then come back out and have a bit more of an informal chat. And I'm going to ask the people on the panel to, to stay loosely around the front and then if people want to come and find you, then come and find us at the front for a, for a question. Um, any last question before we, we go for food? I feel you've missed out on the most important insect of all. There's no payment on bees. Why is that? Are you visiting bringing some in? There are some there are some things for bees in there, so wildlife borders, conservation headlands. Uh, so if you want to increase the number of bees on your farm, there's, there's several things that indirectly will, will do that. And certainly conservation headlands uh, and bee borders are, are in there. Infield grass strips can be sown with wildflowers. So there are things in there, even if there's not something called beekeeping. Um, but absolutely, we can, we can look at uh, other things that can be included in time. Um, if anybody wants to actually do beekeeping as part of their farm business, this isn't the right way to do that. That would be elsewhere within the Agriculture and Fisheries Grant Scheme for, for formal beekeeping. I think that answers it well. So, um, I am going to ask for a round of applause for our panel and then... <laughs> so please just be, um, grab yourselves some food, uh, enjoy and please come and ask questions of any of us at the front informally while, while you're eating. Thanks again very much on behalf of ourselves and DEFA for, for coming along this evening and, and please encourage people to contact us, uh, watch the recording online and engage with the Agri-Environment Scheme. If you don't engage, you know, we can't help you, we, we, we can't help nature and we can't get you your money. So please engage. Thank you.